come so far when we said yes to committing $4.9 billion to guarantee an average of four hours of care per day for those in long-term care. Here, here. We are also saying yes to a plan to put higher standards and more accountability in place. We are doubling the number of long-term care home inspection staff across the province. And we are saying yes to hiring 225 new nurse practitioners in the long-term care sector. But it doesn't stop there, Mr. Speaker. We're saying yes to recruiting more than 5,000 registered nurses and registered practical nurses throughout the health care system, and yes to hiring 8,000 more personal support workers. Today, the Ontario government released its fall economic statement. It's a glimpse down Doug Ford's road to pandemic recovery and his re-election strategy for the upcoming vote. The government will spend about $3 billion more than what was set out in the annual budget on, um, among things like new measures in health care, a new highway and a staycation tax credit. To discuss the province's spending plan and its impact on certain sectors, we welcome to CP24 tonight Rocco Rossi, the president and CEO of the Ontario Chamber of Commerce, and Donna Duncan, the CEO of the Ontario Long-Term Care Association. We also want to welcome Diane Martin, the CEO of the Registered Practical Nurses Association of Ontario. Thanks to all three of you for being here. Donna, I want to start with you. Uh, we heard that clip from the finance minister uh, sort of detailing some of the items that likely uh, are to the benefit of the long-term care uh, sector in this province. You called this plan a defining moment. What do you mean? Well, we know that uh, our sector suffered decades of neglect. Successive governments failed to invest in it, and we saw tragic losses of life. Uh, the government has introduced new legislation. They've made lots of commitments around how they're going to fix long-term care. And today was important because it showed that they are standing by their commitments, the commitments to support our health human resources, recruiting more nurses, RPNs, helping our frontline staff ladder up, helping them with their mental health, uh, building out uh, the accountability, transparency, uh, and, uh, and enforcement in our long-term care homes to ensure safety and quality improvement, uh, as well as building out our capital. Uh, today's announcement, uh, we had 12,000 spaces across the province of existing homes that we knew we needed to replace, uh, and there was no understanding about what that path forward was going to look look like. So, you know, there's remarkable consensus among our members that uh, this is on the right track. Uh, there's putting uh, dollars behind this, so we know that uh, they, the government really is committed. Uh, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, we know that the devil's going to be in the details, but uh, we're, we feel that there is a, a very strong roadmap that's on the right track, that if we all work together, we'll be able to uh, mobilize in order to uh, improve and enhance our long-term care homes, but also with today's announcement, shore up our home care as well as our hospital care. So uh, the pieces are starting to connect. Don, I'm curious, how much of this do you think has to do with Minister Rod Phillips, the new long-term care minister who, let's remind our viewers, was not so long ago the finance minister as well? It, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, it does help to have the finance minister who understands how to navigate uh, cabinet and the, the financial uh, committees of, of cabinet to move things forward. I, I also think that um, he, he has something to prove and uh, he's really committed to getting this right. He's been visiting our homes, dropping in with uh, inspectors for surprise visits uh, across the province. And he's really committed to making sure that he's working towards solutions. So, uh, you, you know, we are, uh, we're really comforted uh, by his leadership uh, and he really is uh, working across the sector, including with our labor partners, our, our other community care partners, and, and really uh, is talking about how are we gonna serve people in the last 20 years of their lives. And uh, we're looking forward to continue to work with him. Uh, there's a lot of momentum right now, and uh, we can't afford to lose it. Rock, I want to ask about uh, the various business sectors that have been struggling as a result of a labor shortage. Does this spending plan address that labor shortage? Uh, not really. There's some great uh, forward-looking investments in um, in skilling, upskilling, uh, there's a good emphasis on the need to uh, move forward on more immigration and doubling the uh, the skilled immigration uh, piece. Those things are not going to 
happen uh, quickly. The really big missing uh, piece is that much as all of us uh, want to have COVID in the in the rearview mirror, uh, wishing it away isn't enough. We we still have work to do. There's still lots of businesses that are not at full capacity, uh, where volumes are not back, where they're struggling with uh, significant debt. And the government did uh, add additional costs with the increases in the in the minimum wage before they're back at full uh, strength. So uh, we were really looking and hoping that there would be some additional uh, items to bridge us to uh, the recovery period. Diane, when it comes to health spending, health budget makes up roughly 40% of the province's budget today. Uh, Minister Bethlen Falvey announcing $342 million to strengthen the nursing workforce by adding or upskilling some 5,000 registered nurses and registered practical nurses. What do you make of this budget? Is this good enough? We know there's a shortage of nurses and health care workers. Does this help fill that gap? Oh, absolutely. It helps fill the gap. Will it be enough? Um, this is going to have to be a beginning, not a standalone solution, simply because the aging population requires more care at the same time that we are looking at a nursing shortage that we're in the middle of, but isn't really expected to end for a number of years. So what this is doing is creating um, more uh, solutions to the nursing shortage, but it also has um, what I think is a really brilliant solution in that it will direct, um, by the way it provides its support, nurses to uh, long-term care and to home care and areas where we previously uh, found the most difficult to staff. So um, nurses who graduate will be required to do a return of service if they've received support, uh, financial support for their education in those sectors. And so we will be bringing in some of our uh, most keen uh, nurse, nurses who have just graduated into those areas. Really good news, uh, particularly for our uh, seniors population. Diane, I also want to ask about something that Donna alluded to. That is $29 million that is going to go toward uh, mental health um, programs for those who work in health care. Obviously, nurses included in that. And also, you know, you talk about the, the labor shortage, nurses that are leaving the industry as a result of the pandemic, the strain on their mental health, a big part of that. Uh, is $29 million enough to go around? And is it enough to retain the nurses that are struggling? I think the nurses, there are a variety of ways nurses are struggling. I think some of those who actually have profound uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome after the uh, time that they've spent in long-term care, I'm sorry, um, w may not be enough, um, may not uh, be enough for those nurses. But certainly um, we found out that 71% of nurses had reached a breaking point in their um, practice this past year and that 34% were considering leaving. So we have no choice but to begin providing that mental health support and continue to find the ways to make sure we address all of that because as important as it is to bring in new nurses, retaining the nurses that we already have is the very most important thing that we can do right now. Rocco, I wanted to ask you about this uh, Ontario staycation tax credit. It sounds kind of sexy. Families who, you know, want to have a staycation here in this province can, you know, get up to $1,000 per individual, $2,000 tax credit per family next year. But at the same time, the government isn't doing anything to, challenge, to uh, deal with the gas tax. So is, is this kind of a double-edged sword? How do you afford to jump in the car with your family and take them somewhere in this province if you're not getting any relief at the pumps? Well, and, and, and clearly uh, tax credits pay at the, uh, the end of the year after you've made the expenditure. So you have to have the money up front to, to spend it in the, in the first place. Look, it, it's, it's helpful. Uh, the tourism industry, the hospitality industry are, are some of the sectors that were hit uh, right from the get-go and are going to be the slowest coming back, particularly with borders only beginning to, uh, to reopen. And so encouraging people to, uh, to rediscover what we have in this amazing province. 
uh, all helpful, but we need to help those providers uh, and those companies and those venues right now while they're still ramping up. And in too many circumstances, government programs are winding down both at the federal and at the provincial levels. So what would you have liked to see then? Because this is kind of a page turner, fall economic statement. We're turning the page from COVID-19, looking forward. What would you have wanted, Rock, over the government to do? Well, is really to understand that uh, much as we all want to look forward, there's still work to do. I, I mean, it's like you're swimming to shore. I can see the shore. Uh, what we don't want are thousands of businesses to drown just before they hit shore, right? We've got to get them. Uh, we've got to get them to the to the other side. And so those supports are crucial. And I'll give you a perfect example right here in Toronto. I mean, technically, the businesses in the path under the office towers are are free to be open. But as they uh, as they will tell you, because most of the people in the office towers are still not expected to come back until the new year. You have big employers like TD saying they're they're still going to expect people to work from from home into the new year. They can open, but if they only have 10 to 15 percent of the foot traffic coming through, that's just a quick way to go bankrupt. And so they still need to be helped to this other side, or you're going to see the permanent scarring of more bankruptcies, and no one will benefit from that. Mm. Rocco Rossi, Donna Duncan, Diane Martin, thank you all for joining us on CP24 tonight. We'll catch up with you again soon. Thank you.